Welcome to church, everybody. It's going to be a great day. We're so glad you're here. High five three people before you have a seat. Welcome. My name is Tim. I'm the lead pastor here at Elevate Life. If it's your first time, let me welcome you. We're so glad that you're here. Welcome home. Welcome home. We are um, so glad to host you today. So good to be in the house with our church family. Love you guys. We are in week three of our series called Believe For It. And we are in this series. We are stretching our faith to the God who is able to do immeasurably more than we ask or can think according to the power that works in us. To the God who not only worked miracles in the past, but is still making miracles today. Does anybody believe that he's still in the business? of stepping into impossible situations and doing what only God can do. And so during this series, there are a couple of things that we're doing uh, a little bit differently. One, um, we are, um, we're, we're shortening service time just a little bit um, so that you have an opportunity on the back end of service, if you wish, to join us for prayer. We'll do one more song on the back end. And every, uh, every weekend, no matter what series we're in, prayer is always available after service. And so our prayer team is always ready and um, eager to, to pray with you and over you if, if you ne ever need prayer or want prayer. But especially during this series, we're talking about believing for miracles. And if there's a miracle that you are praying for in your life, in your family, in any part of your life, um, we want to give you a space and opportunity to join us for prayer for that. So that's one thing's a little bit uh, a little bit different with our flow. And the other thing that we're doing differently is that every week um, before we jump into the message, we're sharing a story, uh, a, a miracle story from someone in our church. Today, I want to read you Cindy's story. She attends here at our Oakleaf location. And um, this is an, an unbelievable story of God's supernatural provision. Today, I'm, I want to talk about miracles of provision. So we're talking about all these different kinds of miracles that Jesus performs. And one of the things that God shows himself to be in scriptures is Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, our provider, the one who is our source and provides everything we need. C Cindy writes this. She said, after going through some very difficult situations in my life, from medical problems, financial and marriage problems, and the loss of family members in my life, I turned to alcohol. I struggled with alcohol addiction for over four years. I was in and out of rehab multiple times. In 2019, I hit my rock bottom. I lost everything. I was arrested for my second DUI and spent 16 days in jail. Once out of jail, I moved into a sober living house. And being that I've been an RN for 20 years, I enrolled in a very strict five-year program for nurses to ensure protection of my nursing license. I went to inpatient rehab for 30 days, but my insurance wouldn't pay for the time I needed to stay for my program. I was thankfully given the option of beginning a 12-week outpatient rehab but my husband and I didn't know how we were going to afford this since the entire amount had to be paid in advance. We were waiting on the facility to let us know how much it would cost. We came to Elevate Life Church on the Sunday before I was starting the next day. I came up after service for prayer with the prayer team. All the ladies there prayed over me and I felt a weight had been lifted at that moment and a sense of peace that I hadn't known for years. After prayer, we were in the lobby and one of the church staff members came up to us and said someone at the church had just made an anonymous donation for us in the amount of $9,000. It, it's gonna get better. At the time, we only had $150 in our account. There are no words to describe that moment. We were overwhelmed to say the least. The next morning, we went to talk with the financial department at the, at the outpatient facility. They had just received all of our information from our insurance company, and they told us that our personal responsibility to start the program was $9,150.
We were without words. We only had tears thanking God over and over for this unbelievable miracle. The whole office at the outpatient facility was in awe and was in tears with us because there was no other explanation. This was only God. I have been working as a nurse since completing that program. Next week is my fifth year of sobriety. My life, my health, my career, my finances, my marriage, my relationship with my daughter, my family and friends have all been fully restored and renewed and are better than they have ever been. It was all God, a true miracle. Come on somebody and give God praise. He's still in the business of providing exactly what you need, exactly when you need it. And today we are going to talk about the way that God shows himself as Jehovah Jireh, our provider. I want to preach to you and teach you today from one of the most famous miracles that Jesus ever um, worked. It is often known as the miracle of the fishes and loaves or the feeding of the 5,000. We're going to read Mark's account of this miracle from Mark chapter 6. Verse 30, let's begin reading. The apostles returned to Jesus from their ministry tour and told him all that they had done and taught. And then Jesus said, let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place and rest a while. You ever just needed a nap? Sometimes the most holy thing you can do is take a nap. Sometimes the most holy thing you can do is retreat and recharge. And he said this because there were so many people coming and going, so much ministry happening, so much demand being placed on them that Jesus and his disciples didn't even have time to eat. So they left by boat for a quiet place where they could be alone. But many people recognized them and saw them leaving. And people from many towns ran ahead along the shore and got there ahead of them. Jesus saw the huge crowd as soon as he stepped from the boat. And he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. Late in the afternoon, his disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go into the nearby farms and villages and buy something to eat. But Jesus said, you feed them. With what? They asked. We'd have to work for months to earn enough money to buy food for all these people. How much bread do you have? He asked. Go and find out. And they came back and reported, we have five loaves of bread and two fish. I want to take my, my title and my theme from verse 31, where the Bible says that because of everything that was happening, because of all of the people that were coming and going, because of all of the ministry that was happening through them and around them, that Jesus and his apostles didn't even have time to eat. That's my title today, just time to eat. And what is intriguing to me about this story and what I noticed this time that I maybe, I don't think I've ever noticed before is that Jesus in this story feeds thousands when he himself was hungry. And Jesus doesn't do it alone. He feeds thousands by way of his disciples when they themselves had not had time to eat. They were the original door dashers going and getting the food from Jesus and delivering it to the people. Imagine being a door dasher who hadn't eaten all day, just smelling it. Mmm, time to eat. Let's pray before we jump in. Lord, thank you for your word. It is our necessary food. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So give us this day our daily bread. Give us what we need today. Let every person in this place, everyone watching online, 
Let us hear what we need to hear for today. To take the step today, to get the encouragement today, to find hope today. Our daily bread, we receive it today by faith in Jesus' name. Amen. It's time to eat. I love this story. Um, I love it because, um, it's you know, I love a party. Come on. This is a big old party. This is a big old fish fry. We got anybody who loves a good fish fry? If you're from the north, I don't know if y'all do fish fries in the north, but here in the south, we do fish fries. We, I remember my daddy and my uncles and my, my grandpa would go fishing when I was a like little kid. They'd go fishing, and, and we always wanted to go with them, but they'd go fishing like in the night. They would stay out sometimes till th- 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning fishing, and they'd come back just covered in muck and mud and with stringers full of catfish, and I knew that meant... It was going to be a fish fry. Come on, fry, catfish. Come on, cheese, grits. Come on, come on, hush puppies. Coleslaw, baked beans. Come on, let's go. If it was time for the fish fry. You, it was fish fry. You invited everybody. You invited mom and them. You invited the cousins. You invited everybody, especially when you had a big old. Well, I don't know why, but we, mama, mama always called it a mess of fish. A mess of fish is the exact quantity of a mess of anything is enough to make a whole meal. If you, she would send us out to the, to the, I grew up on the farm. She sent send daddy out. She said, go get us a mess of collard greens. A mess was enough for a full meal. She, if somebody called a mess of fish, they caught enough for a meal. And, um, and so we would have a fish fry. And I love this story because it's like a big party. It's a big old fish fry. Jesus is, Jesus is cooking it up. Jesus is frying it up. I know he didn't have a fryer, but I feel like the fish that Jesus gave out, it had to be fried, you know, fried cat. I don't even think they had catfish in, in, in Israel in the, in, the, in the first century. I don't know, but I feel like it was fried catfish. I feel like it was hush puppies, you know, these loaves of bread. They, they Come on, they had dipped them in the fryer and took taken them out golden brown. Come on. You know, it was just, I love, I love a fish fry. Um, what's interesting about this story though is the context that precedes it because the, the, the party that we see, the, the, the people and the food and all the things that I identify with that fish fry, the joy, um, that comes in context like that, um, is, is, uh, very disparate from the, Context that immediately precedes this in the scriptures. What has happened immediately before this is that John the Baptist was beheaded. When John is beheaded, of course, first of all, this affects Jesus directly and personally because John is Jesus' cousin. But also the disciples, most of the disciples of Jesus' disciples were originally John's disciples. But when John identified Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the earth, John's disciples stopped following John and started following Jesus. And while they continued to follow Jesus, no doubt they still revered John and loved John as a mentor and as someone who was instrumental in their own journey. And now John is dead. Jesus has been doing ministry. The disciples had been sent out to do ministry. They return back on hearing the news that John has died. They are, they're grieving personally, but they have been succeeding professionally. They, they, the Bible says they tell Jesus of all they get all, they get back from their ministry tour and they're telling Jesus about all that they had said and all that they had done. Everybody who got saved, everybody who got healed, everybody who got delivered, it was success on every hand. And so there's sorrow and success. There's grief and there's, and there's celebration there are, there are things that have died and there are new things that have been born. And what I'm telling you is that in every season of your life, you're going to have both of those things happening at the same time. Jesus dealing with the weight of John's death. Um, realizing that his disciples are in this weird place. They're on this emotional high from the success of their ministry and on this emotional in this emotional valley from the death of their mentor and, 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 and they're, and they're exhausted and they haven't eaten anything. And come on, this is a recipe for disaster. You're not yourself when you're hungry. You got to get that Snickers bar because you're not yourself, you know? And, um, and they, they were hungry and they were exhausted and they were grieving and they, and it was just this emotional emotional roller coaster. And Jesus said, Hey, we got to get away. 
We need to go get some lunch. We need to go take a nap. We need to, we need some rest. We need to recharge. Let's get in the boat. And um, there'll be ministry will be here tomorrow. These people will still have needs tomorrow. There'll still be people to serve tomorrow. But let's go. We, if we don't take care of ourselves, we won't have anything left to give. So let's go recharge. They get in the boat. They start for the other side. But as we have read, the people noticed that they had gotten in the boat. And they noticed the direction in which they were headed. And so they started running around the lake as they were crossing over the lake. Every village they came to, no doubt people asked them, what are y'all running for? We're going to where Jesus is. Jesus is on the way to the other side of the lake. We're going to go meet him there. You should come. And, and they came. And, and the next village, what are y'all running for? Um, we're going to meet Jesus. And more people came. And, and the Bible says village by village by village. Now, by the time that Jesus arrives at the place that he has set out for rest and reprieve, he steps off the boat and there is a huge crowd. We're talking tens of thousands of people. Jesus and the disciples are looking for peace but they have only found more pressure. Have you ever felt like that? Like when you just, mo- the moment you most needed to get away, unplug, the moment that you needed just, I just need a minute, I just need a, I just need a, a time out, I just need, I need for a minute nobody to bother me, nobody to call me, nobody to ask nothing from me, nobody to need nothing from me. And the moment when they need to recharge, they need to receive They step off the boat, and here is a demand being placed on them. And I just find that in life so often, um, we go from one demand to the next, from one crowd, if you will, to the next, from, from, from one context when one group of people needs one thing from us, and then if you're not careful, you, you're at work, and this one group of people need you to be a certain thing, and you get in the car and you come home, and as soon as you step through the door, another group of people need you to be something else. And if we're not careful, we move from one space of demand to the next space of demand, never with an opportunity to refill and replenish. And, and I don't know if I'm Jesus. I'm thinking like he puts one foot on, he sees all the people. I'd be like, nope, nope. Like I'm no, they like put, put the boat. Let's go back somewhere else. They can't outrun us forever. Right? We're going to find some place where there's not a bunch of needy people wanting something from us. But this was not Jesus' response. The Bible says that he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. It got to the place where it was now late in the afternoon, early evening. See, I'm not the only person who goes over my time. Jesus taught them. And, and Mark, who is transcribing this gospel from Peter, Peter's the, believed to be the source of, Mark was Peter's guy, but because of Mark's linguistic skill, skills, um, uh, languages, he's writing for Peter, most likely, and so Peter's likely recounting this to Mark, and, and, and Peter's like, and Jesus, Jesus started teaching them, and he said, put in there many things. He kept on, because he kept on preaching. His clock was in the negative. It was red, and he didn't even care. He said, I got one more point. He said, I'm closing right now. And he was lying, and Jesus didn't lie, but he was, his one more point lasted three more hours. So just so you know, when I do that, I'm just trying to follow my Lord's lead. He was like, now it's late in the afternoon. It's, it's nighttime. And the disciples, remember, the disciples, are they were hungry before they got in the boat. They were hungry before he started this five-hour service. They were hungry hours ago. They are starving right now. So they speak up and they say, Lord, it's getting late. These people, these people must be hungry. You should let them go so we, I mean, so they can eat. (laughs) And Jesus looks at his disciples and says, no, you feed them. And an incredible command for two reasons. First of all, because of the scope of what it would require. If you were going to cater for 20,000 people, 
you would have to prepare months in advance. Just the sheer number of resources that would be required to feed that many people, not to mention to mobilize that much food, prepare that much food, heat that much food. It, it, would, it would be uh, just unbelievable what it would take um, from a, an operational standpoint to pull that off. And Jesus, in the moment, he was like, nah, instead of letting them take care of that themselves, how about you take care of it? And just the scale of it is, is incredible. It seems like an incredible thing for him to ask, but not just is the scale of the request incredible, but the context of the request is incredible because again, he's asking hungry people to feed other people. You feed them. Their response was, I think what some of us respond with when something is asked of us, particularly when we feel like we don't have enough, when we feel like we ourselves need to be cared for. We ourselves need to be blessed. We ourselves need to be served. We ourselves need to be helped. And, and, and we're asked to help somebody else. We ourselves need somebody to serve us. And, and, and somebody at church asks us to serve somebody else. And, and we ourselves need somebody to give to us. And somebody wants us to give to somebody else. It, they, they said, with what? Feet. If we have food, we would have already eaten it. If we had food, we, we're starving. We don't got, like, we're empty. You want, we feed them with what? We don't have enough. And they start to do some math, right? Here's what I found. Your math and God's miracle are often at odds. Your, God's miracle is never going to add up to your math. They start, kids start counting people. They're like, there's got to be, there's 10,000 people here. There's 15,000 people. There's 20,000 people here. They start doing the math. They're like, e- like even, even if we went to the, got the dollar menu, they don't even got dollar menus anymore. You know what I'm saying? They, but, but this was a long time ago, maybe before it, it, the inflation hit real hard. And so like, well, even at the dollar menu, you know, but Jesus is like, no, nah, we can't feed these people dollar menu. Come on. We got to, come on, go to Chick-fil-A, get them the Lord's chicken. You know, I think if Jesus was going to give out meals, he would give out the Lord's chicken. But, but Chick-fil-A, bro, one person at Chick-fil-A, that's $15. Times 15,000 people, they're calculating. They're like, if we, we would have to work, all of us, 12 of us, for months just to pay. Not to mention how long it would take to get it all here. Jesus, you don't understand what you're asking. And Jesus is like, listen, your math is not jiving with what I want to have happen here. And the reason why it's not that you can't add, right? I'm not saying that you don't know how to do math. It's not that you can't count. It's that you're counting the wrong thing. Many times when it comes to the impossible situation in our lives, we start counting on the demand side of the equation. What it's going to cost, how much time it's going to take what it's going to require, how much energy we're going to have to expend. And so they start, they start counting how many people are in the crowd. They start counting how many dollars it will cost. They start counting the expense and the demand. And the demand is massive. And Jesus, notice, he reorients them away from the demand to the supply. They're not even looking at the supply. They go straight to the demand. I find that most of us, honestly, are oftentimes unaware of our supply, but we are hyper aware of our demands. We can tell you all the pressures. We can tell you all the pressure points. We can tell you all the expectations we're trying to meet, all the people we're trying to please, all the balls that we're trying to juggle, all the stuff that we've got to take care of. And Jesus turns their attention away from, don't worry about how many they are. He says this, he said, how much bread do you got? And notice that they don't have a clue. He says, well, go find out. So they, they could do the math on what it would take, but they had no clue on what they had. And so many of us start with what we don't have instead of starting with what we do. Every miracle that Jesus ever does start, ne- it never starts with what you don't have. It always starts with what you do. The miracle begins 
with, with not, not on the demand side, but on the supply side. So God said, Jesus said, well, see what you got. How much bread do you have? And they came back and they said, I told you it wasn't enough. Five hush puppies and two fish. And you know, like these are the hush puppies left over. These are the ones that were overcooked that nobody wanted. These are the fish. Everybody took the big old fish. These are the two like little sad fish that somebody should have thrown back, but they didn't throw back. I mean, we're talking about Nemo kind of little sad little Nemo fish. But like, we got two little Nemos and we got five little burnt hush puppies and that's it. And you, we got 50,000, 20,000, 30,000, whatever it is, people in this place. Jesus, we don't have enough. And Jesus said, Jesus said, give it to me. And the beginning of the miracle that Jesus works, I want to share with you, I want to show you the the two things that Jesus does. The two things, I'm not saying, listen, miracles aren't, it's not do X, Y, Z and get a miracle, but there are principles. If you want to make space for God to do a miracle in your life, and there are two things in particular that Jesus does. First of all, he takes the fish and the bread and the Bible says that he, uh, he, told the, he told the disciples, have them sit down on the green grass. So they sat down. I love this. I, I, I don't know if you noticed it. I don't, know if it. I don't know if it conjures up and brings to mind any other verse. Have them sit down in the green grass. Have them sit down. Make them to lie down on the green pastures. Yeah, the, the Lord is my shepherd. He had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he said, I'll be their shepherd. They're like sheep without a shepherd. So I'll be their shepherd. And what does the shepherd do? He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul for his name's sake. And so he makes them lie down in green pastures. And the Bible says he takes the fish and the loaves. It says he, verse 41, looked up toward heaven and blessed them. If you're writing down notes, I'm going to give you two things. If, If you want to see miraculous provision in your life, there are two things that Jesus did with the fish and the loaves in his hand that you can do with whatever is in your hand. Particularly when what is in your hand is not all that you need. The first thing Jesus did, if you're writing down notes, write it down. You got to say the blessing. Jesus took it and the Bible says he blessed them, not the people. He blessed the fishes and the loaves. He blessed the hush puppies and Nemo and his brother. He blessed the sad little lunch that he had in his hands. He blessed it. And the challenge, listen to me, the challenge for every one of us is not how do I bless it when I like it? It's how do I bless it when I don't? How do I say the blessing over a meal that I didn't even want in the first place? Come on, my mama used to make livers and onions. Now, when she made a meal I liked, it was easy. Lord, thank you for I thank you for these roasts and mashed potatoes. I love roasts and mashed potatoes. I thank you for this. But it was livers and onions. It's hard to give thanks for something you didn't want in the first place. Jesus takes an insufficient meal. Jesus takes something that the disciples had just been cursing. It's not enough. It's in fact, we don't even, we haven't even looked at what it is because it's so insignificant. It doesn't even matter in the light of what we, we need to do. And what they just cursed, Jesus begins to bless. Can you say the blessing? Listen, can you be grateful? Gratitude is not about what's on your plate. It's about what's in your heart. Can you say the blessing when you don't like what's on your plate? I'm not talking about food. I'm talking about your marriage. I'm talking about your job. I'm talking about your family situation. I'm talking about whatever it is in your life that if you were honest, you wish it was something else. I didn't ask for this. I didn't want this. I wish it was more or I wish it was different or I don't eat broccoli or whatever it is. And Jesus blessed it. You have to learn to say the blessing. That is, you have to learn to live a life of gratitude. 
God doesn't, God doesn't bless what you curse. God won't multiply what you keep speaking negatively about. You don't complain your way to a miracle. Let's put it that way. You don't come going around complaining about how it's not enough and how you don't like it and how whatever this thing in your life, that's not what motivates God to do a miracle. Gratitude motivates God to do something in your life. So the question is, how can I have gratitude in my heart when I have gross stuff on my plate? When I've got, a, when, when the things in my life are, are, are broken and hurting and, and they're not good and, and they're not enough, how, what am I just going to lie about it? Thanks for Lord for the livers and onions. So excited about these livers and onions, but I'm not. Here, here's the key. I don't know if you noticed it in, in that verse, the Bible says, Jesus looked up and he blessed them. He didn't bless them while he was looking at them. Because to look at them, he'd be like, Shh, no, these little Nemos are sad. These little burnt, burnt hush puppies aren't going to do nothing. This is not nearly enough. If I look at it, it is never going to look like enough in light of everything that I'm supposed to do. In light of all of my the demands in my life. But he wasn't looking at it. He was looking at him. He looked up to the Lord. And when he was looking at the Lord, he could bless it. The reason you can't have gratitude isn't because it's not enough. It's because you're focused on the wrong thing. How much bread do you have? They said five loaves. He said, wrong answer. No, it's not wrong. One, two, three, four, five. That's not what I'm talking about. How much bread do you have? Because Jesus had already told them in John chapter six, I am the bread of life and whoever comes to me will never grow hungry. How much bread do you have? If, if they understood the question, they would have said, we have all the bread we need. We have the living bread that has come down from heaven. We have the bread that never runs out. Because I'm not looking at what's in my hand. I'm looking at who's in heaven. I'm looking at the source, not the resource. The reason you're depressed, the reason that you're not happy, the reason why it's not enough. Here's the, here's the real crazy thing. that You're convinced that if what's on your plate was different, you would be, you would be more grateful. But the truth is, as long as you look down on the plate, what's on the plate will never be enough. If you got the meal you wanted, if you got the marriage you think you want, if you got the lifestyle you think you wanted, it still wouldn't be enough and you still wouldn't be grateful because gratitude is not about what's on my plate, it's about what's in my heart. If it was about what was on your plate, the people with the most money would be the most grateful. They're not. The people with the, the, people with the most of whatever accumulation, gratitude is not about accumulation, it's about appreciation. And I learned to appreciate what I've got when I realized that what I've got is secondary to who I've got and who's got me. And when I look up, how much bread do I have? I've got all the bread I need. How much of whatever? I, if I have God, I have everything I need. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. I shall not want. He makes me lie down sit him down and he looked up and I think he just smiled because he knew what he was about to do he's about we we're going to do this thing he looks up to the father and he was like my lack what I lack in my hand means nothing in light of what I have in my relationship with the father so he gave thanks you got to say the blessing Gratitude invites the miraculous into your life. I challenge you to practice it. To start saying thanks, giving thanks, saying the blessing. Even when it looks like levers and onions. Then the Bible says that now he began, he, he blessed them. And then verse 41 says, then breaking the loaves into pieces, he kept giving the bread to the disciples so that they could distribute it to the people. So much here. Breaking the loaves into pieces. I've got to hurry, but notice that this miracle of provision. And I would, I would offer to you that m most of the miracles of provision that God provides, notice that it comes in pieces. So they don't get everything all at once. Most of us, that's the way God, we want God to work. We want what we want and we want it all in one delivery. 
But when God works miracles in our lives, and especially miracles of provision, they often come one piece at a time. Are you okay with bite-sized blessings? Can you celebrate the blessing even though it's not everything that you think you need and everything that you prayed for, but can you receive it and celebrate it and appreciate it piece by piece, season by season, moment by moment, because the miracle comes in morsels. You don't get the whole meal at once for multiple reasons. First of all, there were roughly 20,000 people. There are 12 disciples. If you divide 20 by 12, that means that every disciple is going to carry over 1,000 pounds, less than 2,000 or uh, over 1,000 people's meals and less than 2,000 people. So say roughly like 1,500 meals. How much do you think just the weight of the food to feed 1,500 people? Let's just all agree that no one disciple could carry that weight at one time, which means sometimes the reason he doesn't give it to you all at one time is because you can't handle it all at one time. The, the thing he wants to do in you and through you would crush you if he put it all on you at the same time. So I'm gonna give it to you in pieces. The second reason is in the text. The Bible says, so they kept coming back to him and he kept giving them pieces. They kept returning to him and he kept giving them pieces. Here's the second reason he doesn't do it all at one time. It's because he doesn't ever want to put you in a place where you no longer need his presence. He never wants you to separate his provision from his presence. Because he knows if you you get all the provision, then there's a tendency, a human propensity to, to forget about the presence of the Lord and my need for God because I have the resource, I forget the source. And so I'm going to give you enough for right now, but it's not, you're going to have to come back. Think about when he gave the people of God manna in the Old Testament, bread from heaven, a miraculous feeding in the Old Testament. Now in the New Testament, Jesus in another place has already said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. I am manna. When, When they got manna, the night before they got manna, God spoke to the people and said, tomorrow, through Moses, he said, tomorrow you will be filled with bread because they were complaining they didn't have no bread. Tomorrow you'll eat all the bread you want. Tomorrow came, the morning came when they woke up, manna was already on the ground. They walked outside and they said, what is this? This is literally what the word manna means in Hebrew. It means, what is this? Just like that, what is this? Mana, what is this? And then they asked Moses, where's the bread? Go read it. Where's the bread? Why? Because they were looking for a loaf in a bag with a twisty tie that said wonder bread. This wasn't wonder bread. This was, I wonder where the bread is. Because it does not look like what I thought it would look like. It didn't come in the form that I thought it would come in because it came, the Bible says it was flakes pieces on the ground. God sends the provision, but he puts it, he gives it to you in pieces. And notice he said, and if you try to pick up too many pieces, and if you try to keep enough for tomorrow, it will rot overnight. You can only pick enough up for today. Why? Because I want you to come back to me tomorrow and realize, he said, when you pray, pray like this, give us this day our I'm going to give you enough, but you're going to have to pray this prayer again tomorrow. I'm going to make sure you have to hit your knees again tomorrow because I never want you to think, why don't you give us enough for a month? Because I want to see you again before a month. You need to know my provision is tied to my presence. I want you to keep coming back to me. So God never gives you so much that you don't need him. He gives you what you need. He gives us our daily bread. Here you go. And it's enough for right now. But we have to keep coming back. So he breaks the loaves into pieces and he keeps giving. He kept giving the bread to his disciples over and over and over. But it's this next phrase as we come close to our close. In Jesus fashion. Just one more point. That might last till the afternoon. He kept, they kept coming back to him and he kept giving them food. So that. Notice this phrase. So they could distribute it to the people. He broke the loaves and the pieces. He kept giving the bread, kept giving the bread, kept giving the food to the disciples. So they could give it away. 
you're writing down notes, write down this. Here's the second thing. The first thing you gotta, you gotta say the blessing. Can you, can you bless it when you don't like it? Anybody can give thanks for the things in their lives that they love, the things that are just the way they would want them to be. Can you give thanks for the things that aren't? Can you say the blessing? Number two, can you be the blessing when you want to be the blessed? It's going to get quiet. Listen to me. The disciples, the Bible says, hours ago, had not had time to eat. They were hungry. Jesus said, let's go find us a place. We're going to eat some lunch. We're going to rest, maybe take a nap. We're going we're gonna to re- re- revive and recharge maybe eat some more take another nap come on we're going to just take this day and we're going to chill and they stepped right into tens of thousands of people like sheep without a shepherd and I think the disciples are looking at Jesus like what are we going to do should we leave Jesus said no this is what I came for And he began to teach them many things. And the disciples, when it got late, said, it's getting late. We should let them go. And Jesus said, no. We should feed them. With what? This little, this sad little, you want me to serve people with what? You want me to share my faith? I don't even know, I hardly know the scriptures. You want me to give generously? I hardly got enough money to pay my bills. You want me to serve somebody else, help somebody else? I need help myself with what? Jesus said, sit them down. They sat them down. Thank you, Father. This is more than enough. Ah, oh, thank you for this bounty. Remind me of like a Christmas carol. Y'all know. Come on, y'all know. Dickinson. A Christmas carol. A little Tim Crutchet, tiny Tim. Little sad little Tim on his little Christmas time at the Crutchet house. No, nobody. Got the saddest little bird you ever did see at the table. Got about 12 children gathered around. Not nearly enough for all these people. Tim, would you say the blessing? Thank you, Father, for this bounty, for all of this food. You're looking around like, what is he talking about? Thank you, Father. No, this, is, this is more than enough. And then he started to break it. Now these disciples were starving. Whoo, they hungry. And Jesus starts to cook. Whoo, that fish is frying. Ooh, them hush puppies are dropping. Now they're floating, they're floating. When they're floating, you're getting close. Hey, golden brown. Hot. I mean, right out the fryer, like you bite into them, and then the steam comes out. Come on. Jesus gets some of it. Hey, Pete, come here. Pete's so hungry, bro. Pete about to fall over. Here you go, Pete. Some catfish, some hush puppies. Pete, ooh. He said, take him right over there. Right over there. Yep. Andrew, Andrew, Andrew. Here you go, man. Andrew's like, he said, yeah, over there. You go over there. Way out there. How long do you think it would have taken 12 men to serve 20,000? And the whole time they did it on empty stomachs because it wasn't time to eat. Listen to me. If you want to follow Jesus, the crowd, the only miracle they ever experienced is being fed. But the disciples experienced the the miracle of being a feeder. The crowd gets blessed, but the disciples get to be a blessing. 
We're talking about miracles. What if the miracle that God wants to do right now in this season is a miracle he does through you instead of for you? Are you okay with that? Because we all want to be on the receiving end of the miracle. The receiving end of Cindy's miracle. We want to be the one getting the $9,000 check. But there's another side to the miracle. It's the one who is in a place where you can hear the Holy Spirit give you a number for a person you hardly know that they don't even know what they need yet. And you can obey the Lord and make a... And do something that changes their lives forever. Matter of fact, I didn't even tell you the whole story. The whole story is Cindy is now on our legacy team, which means she's a part of people in our church who have a gift of generosity and help lead our church in giving. Five years ago, somebody sowed into her and she got to be blessed. But now she said, it's one thing to be blessed. It's another thing to be a blessing. And if you want a supernatural overflow in your life. God says, I need to know you can say the blessing and you can be the blessing. Can I put it in your hand? And you not have to put it in your mouth. Here, here, here. The very thing you want that you feel like you need that they probably felt like they deserved. We've been out here on a ministry tour, preaching the gospel, working for the Lord all this time. We've been through hell and high water for Jesus. If anybody deserves to have a bite to eat, it's us. And instead of a spirit of entitlement, I deserve this. He gave me these hush puppies and this fish. I deserve a bite. I deserve to eat instead of entitlement. It's gratitude and it's generosity. What might God put in your hands if he knew he could get it into someone else's? How much, how much food do you think passed through their hands that day? Roughly 1,500 people were fed. Hundreds and hundreds of pounds of fish and bread food and if they had taken it and eaten it the miracle would have stopped there now it still would have been a miracle because five hush puppies and two nemos not going not going to feed even 12 grown men it still would have taken a miracle he was still breaking it blessing it every time he broke it it multiplied every time he gave it away it multiplied because every time you give it away it multiplies But the miracle would have stopped the moment they ate. It would have been the miracle of the 12. The feeding of the 12 doesn't quite have the same ring to it, does it? What if the reason that God doesn't release miracles in our lives is because he knows it won't go any further than our lives? What if he knows if he blesses us, the only person that gets blessed is us? What if he knew that if he blessed me, I'm going to be a blessing? What if he knew that I'm going to be a door dasher? (laughs) Hey, I got some blessing God gave me. I just wanted to deliver it. Come back. Lord, would you bless me? What do you think God's response is when he just saw you take what you yourself wanted and gave it? You know what? This time I'm going to break off a little bigger piece. I'm going to trust you with even more. And you take it and you're blessed. I'm just telling you, the, 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 greatest, the greatest lifestyle you can live is one that is connected to the presence of God, but also the presence of people. The presence of God because he has what they need. The presence of people because I'm on earth and he's in heaven. When he was on earth, he could heal, he could bless, he could teach, he could. But now he's ascended to the right hand of God. And now I'm on earth, but I can go to him. James says, you have not because you ask not. And because when you ask, you ask with the wrong motives. You ask just to satisfy your own pleasures. Listen to me. The miracle is always limited by the motive of the disciple. And they kept serving 
until everybody had eaten everything they wanted. And you know some of them. You ever been to a church dinner on the grounds? You ever been to dinner on the grounds at homecoming? Their people will show up to homecoming. They don't come any other day of the year. But if there's dinner on the grounds, if there's a potluck, They're coming. They won't bring anything. They don't bring a pot. They don't bring a spoon. They don't bring a cup. They don't bring, they don't even get soda. They don't bring nothing, but they're going to be in the first one in the line. And then they're going to be the ones popping out four different take home. Do you know how many, do you know how many times somebody said, I'll take seconds. I'll take thirds. I'll take fourths. And the disciples were feeding people seconds when they themselves hadn't even had a first. Can God trust you like that? Can he trust you to be a blessing when you just wanted to be blessed? And everybody got filled. And then Jesus said, now it's time. It's not that his people don't eat, but we don't eat first. We give first. This is the principle of the tithe. It's not just that we give, it's that we give first. It's that before it goes in our mouths, it goes out. It goes to God. It goes to his purpose. It goes to his people. It goes to his heart. It goes to reach people. Can God put it in your hands? God, I'm I'm not going to eat first. And what happens when you don't eat first is that you eat more. And they ate everything they wanted to eat. And they had all the fish they wanted to eat. If they had st- if they had just eaten what he put in their hands, they would have gotten a handful. But they ate and they ate a belly full. And then they collected everything else and they took home a basket full. The people who only ate carried nothing home. It's not that God won't provide for you. But if you want a life of overflowing provision, if you want baskets full instead of just a belly full, If you want the kind of blessing that doesn't just fill your belly, but allows you to go home and feed your family and bless others and, and, and offer things that change generations on the way, I'm going to fill your basket. Why am I going to fill your basket? Because while you go, you're going to find people. And I know I can trust you that you are going to be a blessing. Provision comes when I learn gratitude and generosity, when I can say the blessing. And when I can be the blessing, even when what I have doesn't seem that significant. Preacher, I would serve more if I had more time. It's not enough. I would give more if I had more money. It's not enough. I would share the gospel more if I knew more of the scriptures. It's not enough. Is it not enough? How much bread do you have? I have everything I need. Whatever is in my hand is enough if I am in his hand. The Lord is my shepherd and I lack nothing. Come on, let's pray before we get out of here today. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Let me pray for you. If you're here today and you're far from God, you're not where you need to be with God. Many times we seek to find fulfillment in life to fill ourselves through bread, through money, through relationships, through men or women or through possessions, through power, through accomplishments, through all of these things. And I'm just telling you, as long as you look down at the resource or look out at the demand, you're going to be depressed because there will always be more demand out there than resource in your hand. But if you look up, you'll realize that there is more supply. Some of you look at the demand of your sin, the demand of your failures, the, the weight and the magnitude of what you've done and how often you've done it, how bad you've done it. And, and you're convinced it's too bad. It's too much. But if you would look up, If you would look to the cross, you would see that the supply is far greater than the demand. 
that what Jesus provided when he said it is accomplished is far greater than whatever demand your sins have placed on it. That, that, that you could not possibly, I don't know why you think you're, you're, you're so significant that you think that you could sin more than Jesus could forgive. That you could mess up more than he could grace. No, 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 no. Your sins don't begin. They are a drop in the bucket of how much grace that he's got. His grace is sufficient. It's more than enough. I don't know. I don't know if there's enough forgiveness for me. There's more forgiveness available, more grace available, more hope available, more joy available, more, more, more renewal and restoration available. The supply has no end. And so if you'll stop looking at the demand and you'll start looking at the supply, if you'll start looking at the Lord, come on, if that's you today, you need a fresh supply of grace, forgiveness, mercy, a new start. Come on, pray this in your heart while I pray out loud, God, right now, our sins are great, but your grace is greater. The demand is significant. My my, my mistakes were many, but your mercy is so much more. So today, I stand with hope, not that my sins weren't great, but that your mercy was so much greater. Not that I didn't do wrong, but that you did so, so much right. Not that the wages of my sin is not death, but that your gift of of faith, of life, of grace is everlasting life in Christ Jesus. So we receive it right now. We receive bread the living bread. We receive our full supply of everything we need in Jesus. And and God, those of us who are already following Jesus today, I pray that you would teach us the art and instill in us the grace to say the blessing and to be the blessing. Even when we feel like we're not enough and it's not enough. And what's going on around us is way too much. And what's, what we have in us is way too little. God, we refocus our eyes on you. The supply is always greater than the demand. When the supply is the Lord himself. We receive it now in Jesus' name. Amen.